Several weeks ago, Michael Spindler and I posted a message to all of you about the directions that Apple is taking as we move forward into the 1990s. This is still a tough and challenging industry, but Apple continues to do well. We wanted to give you an update on this and to let you know that our strategy has not changed since we began this new course almost two years ago. But our commitment is still focused first on our core business, Macintosh. Yeah, John, I think that's uh, extremely important to keep in mind that any future progress building Apple from a one product slash business company into a multi-business company starts with not blinking on the Macintosh. And we have proven over the last 20 months how to effectively compete in an ever-increasing competitive environment driven by uh, signs of commoditization and hardware. Uh, we have proven to be able to put out product in faster cycles and win in the marketplace. Well, that's true, Michael. And we have gained significant market share we have reduced our time to market from two and a half years down to under 12 months. Uh, we are ramping to global volume much faster because we are a global business. We've been able to get much more productivity out of our R&D investment, and our field organizations are doing a terrific job giving us uh, strong momentum in the marketplace. So it is working. Macintosh is strong. It's our core business today. It will be in the future. And we couldn't even think about going into some of the new ventures that we're interested in unless we had strength in our core business. Yeah. I mean, talking about new ventures, this uh, has certainly stirred interest and in, in here and there a controversy. People wonder where we get from one stage to the other. And I think we will have time to, to go through this a little bit more in detail as the uh, uh, program unrolls here. <clears throat> but uh, let's drill back to the Macintosh. I think that uh, it isn't over with the uh, uh, heated competition. I think that uh, we are really seeing uh, hardware progress in terms of uh, the other category of technology, the, the Intel Microsoft domain, uh, 486 machines in color will enter the marketplace soon at, at very low price points. And we are not immune from uh, this uh, roller coaster in, in the uh, marketplace where we see new channels emerging, uh, customer behavior is different in, the, uh, in a more maturing marketplace. They buy from new channels in a very different way. Just Nine months ago, we haven't seen some of the, the packet bells uh, uh, being enforced in, in the marketplace. So we have to be very vigilant uh, and not rest on, on, on the success we have. I mean, people congratulate on the strategy that we've put in place and stuck with this and executed this. We have done this with, with uh, a certain amount of pain. I think the organization is, is, is feeling pain in terms of uh, where's the resource and how can I do all these things that. Uh, that apparently needed to, to be done. So I think uh, I'm absolutely aware of, of this level of pain that got created, but we're winning with this. So it is not um, easy by no means, and we should not let loose on working hard and pushing this Macintosh forward in notebooks and desktops and build out this property and move software fast to do new exciting things and get the market growing. Well, look, Michael, you and I both <coughs> had dinner recently with our resellers in the United States. In fact. Uh, these were CEOs of resellers who represented about $2 billion of Apple sales. And the thing that really struck me was that they were looking at us as the only bright light in the entire industry. That they said, you've got innovative products, your products are selling, they are differentiated. To me, uh, these people were very uh, clear and forceful in their opinion about Apple is the bright spot that has a future, pointing out into leveraging our technology, building different things, and yet compete in the hardcore of what it is today. And what we saw in the last six, nine months in the Intel Microsoft category is a brand displacement. Not that this market has grown tremendously. It is just what, what used to be IBM and Compaq moving through a channel called reselling is now Packard Bell and Dell Computer in a different channel. So the overall market in that category didn't grow all this much. We grew because we found that we still have differentiation in the Macintosh and elasticity in the marketplace, and we can sell it for a little more than all these other clone brands. Not this should make us all complacent, but I think that we still can create, but we must create it faster, real innovation to let the market grow. To me, it is not so much important that we see this picture of less gross margin. What we have to do is make this a growth business, 
then we have more sufficient resource to create other things, including pushing the Macintosh forward. Well, I think one of the things we've learned over the last two years is that <coughs> we can still make good profits at lower gross margins. We had thought in the past that the only way to make high profits was to have high growth industry, high gross margins. What we've learned is that when we can dramatically compress the time to market and build what we call hit products, which are products that really help sell themselves, that those products are able to give us a, a very high return, even at lower gross margins, because there's less marketing effort behind those products to, to get high volumes. Mm -hmm. The challenge is from an implementation standpoint, which means that worldwide manufacturing has to ramp up many products simultaneously around the world. Uh, it, it means that we have to uh, have follow-on products that come on very quickly. So we're proud that we have the ability to get products out in under a year, but we know we have to get that probably down to products coming out every six months. Mm -hmm. So the focus is really going to be continuing in the 1990s for Macintosh on better and better implementation. And it means that we have to hit on all 12 c cylinders all the time. And that's, mm -hmm. that's tough on, on all of us, but um, that's the name of the game right now. Yeah. Well, I think that some of this has, has really worked well, and thanks to all the efforts uh, across the world and in, in all parts of, of the organization. Uh, this this um, principle of hit products, um, we learned from this. I mean, we saw uh, over a year ago that th the classic hits the sweet spots in the installed base in this price band of, of $1,000 to $1,500 in black and white. And this was the fastest selling product we ever had. This year it's different. It's the LC because we finally get the market to understand what an LC is. We all of a sudden see surprises that the CI is in high demand. The Quadra is doing, I would say, reasonably well. Because, again, people have to, in this sector of the market, being adjusted to what the complexity and functionality is of, of 700 and 900 quads. But it's doing well. And, and last but not least, the power books. We've been late to this market called notebooks, and this is the winner, right? Yeah. Well, in fact, in the U.S. <coughs> in the first quarter, uh, Apple went from not even being in the industry of notebooks to number one in the entire industry in the United States for, for power books. 25%. 25% yeah. market share, That's which is pretty terrific. impressive. Yeah. But the, the thing which uh, I think is, is going to be really challenging for all of us is, is uh, uh, watching the, the forecasting of all of these different products. Now that we have such a wide range of Macintoshes, um, it's very hard to know which one of these is going to, to really be a, a big seller. And the, the tuning of the pricing becomes key. You remember when we brought out the Mac Classic, it just took off. We came out with the Classic 2. The product was a little bit high priced for the, for the market, mm -hmm. and we didn't get the kind of sales that we expected. On the other hand, we were out of stock <coughs> on power books and out of stock on yep. CIs and SIs. So balancing this all out is, is really a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, implementation task for us around the world. I mean, the art of forecasting is, is, is never going to be less than a challenge. I think that uh, we, we can learn from some of these things that we say. If you make a product revision, uh, you're putting more functionality or power into a design center that we got to keep this at the same price in the original model. So the classic one to classic two, we shouldn't have increased the price just because it is an O3O based product. So we have to learn from these little um, effects to not get this up again rather than down. So driving the price points is, is OK if it creates more market price and it's clearly differentiable. And the product line gets broader but more understood. We segment these product lines so we can address new channels and have the addressable market being much wider than just marketing to our uninstalled base. This is not good enough in the Macintosh business. Yeah, I think what's impressive with the Macintosh performance right now is that this is really global performance. I just came back from Japan recently, was at Mac World. A year ago, we had 61,000 attendants at Mac World, Tokyo. This year, 150,000. A year ago, there it's were- It's beat San Francisco. <laughs> absolutely, it's the largest Mac World we've ever had in the world by, by double. And uh, this year, uh, we went from 50, Mac user clubs in Japan to 300 Mac user clubs. The momentum that Apple is enjoying in Japan is really unprecedented because the Japanese computer industry is in a uh, real tailspin at, at the moment. And uh, they're down almost 30%. We're up over 40%. And the Japanese uh, computer executives are just scratching their heads saying, you know, how does Apple do this? Well, it's great products. It's great people. It's great implementation. It's all things coming together. And fortunately, we're seeing this in in Latin America, Southeast Asia, in Europe, the United States, Canada, you know, right across the world. So this is positive. On the other hand, we can't paint the picture too bright mm -hmm. because the industry is tough. It's not and growing it's as fast. The prices are coming down. 
and it only gets gets harder, unfortunately, as we move well, out of the 1990s. It's not over with. I mean, two two comments to what you said. One is that uh, what still matters is brand recognition, and Apple just stands out. This example of Japan is just uh, um, really uh, eye-opening. We couldn't be more NEC-ish than NEC in Japan. We had to be Apple, and this is a winning proposition because people like to be involved with this kind of product, be it from a reselling end or a user point of view. Uh, so brand still matters. Design still matters. The power books are just great products because they're ergonomically designed. We put communication in which we will probably talk more about how important communication is to us in the future. Um, so design matters. Everything has to run. I mean, you, you talked about these 12 cylinders. Everything has to work. Um, I would second saying it's not over. The clone people will not roll over. They have clearly stated whatever it takes for them to compete, uh, they will do. In other words, the price game and war isn't over yet. I have no illusion that as we go forward that we have to somewhat respond if these people go crazy and fight for their lives. It doesn't mean for us suicide. I don't believe this. If we can still put innovation into the Macintosh, I believe we can go on forward. We can grow the marketplace. So it's not necessary that margin drops be disastrous. I think we have to translate the advances of technology into market growth to address new users. Well, we have made tremendous progress in the education market, particularly in the last two years. We've completed the transition from Apple II over to, to Macintosh. Uh, that's a solid footing. It's really an annuity business for us going forward, and there's a lot of, of opportunity to expand it. We're doing well in the home. We're doing well with home office. We're doing well with, with small business. But in large business, uh, it seems to get harder for us, Michael. And it looks like at this time that, that Windows is making a lot of progress in large business, uh, that even if it's not as good as Macintosh, some of these customers say, I don't care. It's open. The hardware is cheap. Uh, it connects into everything else. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what we're doing in the enterprise world to, to address that issue? I think that... Uh it's a critical factor for Apple's future growth and success. Uh, it's been hard to win in large corporations any place in the world um, in mission-critical applications. But really, corporations put the trust into Apple and say, we're going to run parts of our company on, on network Macintoshes. What we've been successful with was putting Macintosh into the creative aspect of these companies in their sales and marketing and publishing departments because this was all about graphical applications and it stands synonymous with, with publishing. Those were the inroads we made into large corporations. Um, and, and three things happened in the last couple of years in there. One is still a mentality of, of mapping PCs into mainframes, i.e. terminal to mainframe connection. That's what the real success of DOS was, is, is all these clone machines and very simple functionality, no graphical user interface, mapped into a terminal mode into an existing mainframe box. The second thing that occurred was technical computing in the engineering departments around Unix. That's the success story of Sun and the likes, HP Apollo. And the third was uh, a PC-to-PC -PC type environment where the non-computer users, so to speak, the power users, created that structure. So there are two, three different environments that, that happen in large enterprises, overlooked by the IS director, if you want. And this is going to change over time into a much, much more uh, distributed environment, client-server architecture, their real architecture. Nobody has this, which is our chance, because we're not going to map it into an old structure. We're trying to build a client-server architecture where we really can shine and build some specific solution sets moving the Macintosh upwards, if you want. We never had a declared server strategy. We will now will have one. And that, if you reference again to this reseller meeting, they said, finally, the pieces are falling together. And that's also, I guess, in this whole space where the IBM uh, relationship will play most, and that's what it's designed for. I yeah, guess. The thing I heard from the resellers was they <coughs> said, uh, you know, get this story out with what you're doing, because your, your short-term strategy, or your long-term strategy makes sense. We now understand you know, even clearer why you're doing this with, with IBM and the enterprise uh, market, the story has to be told. And um, you've been working very closely with IBM, I know, in the implementation of several parts of, of yeah. the IBM alliance. Maybe you can just bring people up to date on how that's doing. Yeah, well, the first three sort of more immediate and critical pieces was this, number one, create a very powerful and sustainable risk architecture. And we will prioritize this in the Macintosh as we move most of the Macintoshes onto risk platforms. Yeah, I think the key thing that, that people may not be aware of is that Apple is the only personal computer company that said we're going to move our entire product line over to, to risk 
And the reason we selected IBM, because uh, there were many other risk processors we could have selected, everyone else was going for superscalar, 64-bit, the most performance they could get at any cost. We were interested in taking their know-how with physical sciences and drive this thing down so we could be able to put it on yeah. an LC or a classic. Yeah, you can even see this in today's announcement of digital with this alpha chip. It's a 64-bit superscalar single chip used in high-end workstation. That's fine, but that's not what we want. It's got doing. nothing to do with our no. market. What we want is to take the promise of risk technology and siphon this on into very, very low-cost, uh, exciting products where software, again, makes a difference. For us, risk in Macintosh is not to run applications faster, is that we need an underlying, more performing platform to do all these wonderful things that we've worked through ATG into the uh, software uh, uh, group, i.e. speech, 3D, uh, new architecture, graphics, all these new, what we call natural classes of human interfaces that Apple stands for to build out to create new applications and new marketplaces. And that's the fundamental promise that we have to deliver to it, is build the marketplace rather than stagnant, and that it's only a price game, and this is not very fun. Yeah, I, I think what uh, Microsoft has proven <coughs> is that if you don't bring innovation to the industry, the, inno the applications don't add new functionality, and the industry slows down. Right. And so th the only way we can drive the industry growth again is to uh, keep stretching the hardware platform so that we can show off the software, right. and that's why the risk is so important so to us. So that's uh, one thing, and we, we make really good progress in the uh, CDC, which is the Customer Design Center in Austin. Uh, the three main projects uh, define, which are the publicly discussed chips. Now, I think in the Custom Design Center, we're up to almost 100 employees, is that right? More than that, and there are three chip designs running in parallel right now that are described for a, a low-end uh, product, a, a mainstream personal computer product, in some more high end. So this will give us the uh, broadest range of choice of risk processors of, of any platform. As, as far as we can see, yes. Yeah. So that's one thing that's well underway. It's staff, people are on schedules. We're having weekly uh, working meetings between uh, Apple people who are on site in the CDC. We have a person being inside the CDC, uh, plus eight others, uh, contributing to the design work. That's well under the way. The second thing that is very important for us, which gives us a needed uh, entry into large business is the interoperability uh, initiative. We announced uh, that last year, and we've shipped already two products, which were actually ahead of schedule. One was the um, um, uh, token ring connection from Apple Talk, which we did ourselves by licensing uh, IBM's token ring chips. And one is their router product, which they put in the marketplace. So those are two uh, uh, visible pieces of that this works, and it was important to them too. And there will be about five to six products at the end of the market this year that are done either at Apple or at IBM. The third thing is building um, open systems by uh, creating this client-server platform. And for us, the server isn't just sort of a general purpose server. What we want to do is building a balanced architecture between Macintosh clients and higher-ended server machines could go after a specific environment in data distribution or in image processing or in media type uh, distribution and, and link these two systems and do something to usability and usefulness. And uh, one of the things I might say is the first uh, System 6000 we got into here just because we need them for compiler work, we looked at that and said we wouldn't do an implementation like that. So when people ask the question, by the time you have open systems and IBM will build them and, and Bill will build them and other people who will go out into the PowerPC platform, how do you differentiate? Just the fact that I could see some of these IBM products or other products, we will never make an implementation like that. So there's still much, much room for us to innovate, even if we open up through Unix-based systems the world of servers by transiting the applications environment of a Mac into. And so the price to open is a higher resource system than the native Macs that are absolutely crisply built to get the maximum out of the performance of risk for personal computing systems. Now, you've covered three of the five initiatives with IBM, PowerPC, interoperability, PowerOpen. There are two others, joint venture companies. Uh, the first one is Caligent, which is the object-based system company, which uh, now is up and running. We have a management team in place. The incorporation has been completed. Uh, the public announcement's made, and they are now officially a joint venture corporation owned equally by IBM and Apple. So that's off to a good start. Uh, a lot of people really aren't clear, though, what is the product that Caligent is building. And I think the best way to describe it is that uh, they are trying to address 
a very different problem than today's personal computers uh, are capable of doing. And the problem they're trying to address is one that has to do with enterprise markets where large MIS shops spend 85 to 90 percent of their annual budget on maintenance of existing applications and systems. What Taligent's technology promises is the ability to compress that time down by a factor of 10 to reduce the cost by probably a factor of 10 to increase the reliability and allow you to have customized solutions in the 1990s as we had shrink-wrapped applications in the 1980s and to do all of that with the same elegance of a user interface as we were able to apply to, to the Macintosh. And all of that will be very complementary to what we do with Macintosh. So by the mid-1990s, when Taligent is there, we expect that the hardware platforms will have enough memory so that you'll see actually uh, maybe two environments existing on the same system in an enterprise market so that it will be uh, Macintosh System 7 or whatever version we're in at that time with a complementary uh, Taligent, which can work on customized solutions and this will all be part of a client-server world. And the real way to judge, I think, the Apple-IBM relationship is client-server. The reason we did it was enterprise markets. The other one was our joint venture company with uh, IBM on multimedia called Kaleida. The tremendous runaway success we're having with QuickTime uh, has meant that we've had to make sure that we really understood well where QuickTime was going to go over the next two, three, four years, where Kaleida goes, and I think we've worked out those details with IBM so that those two things are going to be very complementary. What we're going to do is take QuickTime as a layer of technology, not only the Macintosh, but move parts of that technology across to, to other platforms to head off Microsoft from trying to set the standard too low and therefore uh, close out the opportunity for QuickTime to, to really become a pervasive technology, much the way PostScript has become a pervasive technology. On the other hand, Kaleida uh, adds in a, a scripting language, a consumer operating system. Uh, it also adds in a common data format so that content that's developed for IBM computers or Apple computers will be able to play on both machines. So this venture uh, is also taking shape very rapidly. I'd say overall the IBM relationship uh, still looks very positive now about six or seven months later. No, I think it's, it's uh, uh, validating some assumptions we made when you look around what happens in other risk and, and, and environments such as uh, MIPS slash ACE, uh, how Sun is able to pull off some of the uh, developments they have to do. So from a risk standpoint, that was probably a good decision uh, moving forward and, and everything else to that matter too. We still have to do most of our of our own work. I mean, there is, as I said, room for product differentiation, even if you try to get to common grounds in what we call in this relationship enabling technologies. Uh, I'd like to go back to QuickTime. This is a big deal. And uh, I think for the first time, I personally believe that multimedia is real. Uh, when we saw things that we have done in, in previous years on the multimedia lab, uh, you had to have 10 technicians come in, cable it up, and set it up. and and, and you, you would never get this into a framework of head and saying, I am able to do all this thing. Right now, I believe all the pieces are falling into place, and it is as simple and compelling as when we had desktop publishing come in. So you immediately get it. In QuickTime, uh, uh, when I li uh, listen to our uh, uh, developer group, is the fastest piece of software adaption for developers. Uh, since the original introduction of the Macintosh. Yeah, let's just take a moment to make sure everyone understands what QuickTime is. QuickTime is software. Uh, it deals with something that was never designed into personal computers in the early years, and that is time synchronization, so that you can take animation and video and graphics and text <coughs> and sound and be able to synchronize this together. It also has compression algorithms built into it so that uh, you can handle video and animation, which tend to take a lot of memory and compress that down but it's designed in a way that you can um, take out our compression algorithms and substitute in others as they may be developed in future years. So it's a very scalable architecture. The applications are shielded from the compressors, so you can make substitution without having to write new drivers. Same thing is true with the component manager, which allows you to control laser disks or CD-ROM drives or camcorders, again, shielding the application from what those devices are, so you don't need special drivers for it. So it's a very scalable architecture. When we introduced it in December, uh, a few weeks later, we had 120 applications at Macworld in San Francisco. By the time we showed up in Tokyo, uh, just about a month later, uh, we were up to over 230 applications. So the, the speed at which this is being yeah, adopted, it's and it's going from education, K-12, education, higher ed, training, 
personal productivity, presentations. It's, it's the most pervasive um, technology that we've had since the introduction, uh, the the introduction of the Macintosh and desktop publishing. The one mistake we could do with this, again, is to holding it to ourselves. And if you look around, what, what's there in the com competitive field isn't there. So the wrong thing would be to hold it close to us. And as you la laid it out, we want to take the best implementation in a system on the Macintosh, but let this layer travel across other platforms, so on Windows or Unix. And therefore, we build a QuickTime layer across the entire industry. The whole infrastructure around titles, distribution of software in multimedia through this QuickTime layer, but the best implementation on CD-based Macintoshes, as it will come out this year, uh, is an offering that's crisp. And we might we can brand QuickTime and saying that it becomes synonymous, other like PostScript, across multiple platforms. Yeah. Well, if you remember back in the 1980s, we used to try to do everything ourselves and then keep the technology to ourselves. Uh, in the 1990s, it's very clear that we have to drive the innovation in the industry because no one else is going to step up to the plate and do it. And we have got to have very rapid time to market because that's the way that we are able to compete as we move a technology like QuickTime over to play on other people's machines. Mm -hmm. But if we don't put it out on other pe people's machines, then what happens is we get isolated like an island and we'll discover that, that stuff that is less good will appear out there and we'll lose the ISVs and they'll be out developing mm -hmm. on that and we'll miss another great opportunity. So we're going to move these technologies as rapidly as we can yeah. across platforms. I think also one of the reasons of, of the stagflation of this industry right now is, is far less the, the recessionary trends we have throughout the world. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, the economics of, of Australia and Canada are so dismal, uh, we, we, we call it this depression, and yet we'll be able to increase our market share tremendously and sell uh, 30, 40 percent more volume in those, in yeah. those territories. Well, it's incredible. I mean, Australia, which is in a depression, uh, we're up 48 percent. Yeah. And sure. Japan, which is uh, a market down almost 30 percent, uh, we're up over 40 percent. Mm -hmm. And Canada, we're seeing the same thing. The U.S. we're gaining share. Europe, we're gaining share. Latin, Amer Latin America, we're, we're booming. So we are showing incredible performance around the world in a very, very tough environment. But that is at the expense of the other brand leaders. So in the U.S., for instance, we have constantly increased our share in the U.S. reseller channel. And that's by far the most important distribution channel to, to, to the marketplace. Yet we see other phenomena coming up, like mass merchandisers and superstores. We cannot ignore this trend. So we're not going to walk out of the work we've been doing over years and years with the U.S. reseller base, but we've got to look at segmenting our prior line to make it easier to segment that into the channel mapping. And that's work going on with uh, Bob Puet's organization and, as a matter of fact, in other parts of the world, to build out this complicated channel matrix and make sure that we don't trip over each other and just don't substitute dollars that were sold over here in this part of the channel, sold over here, and then we don't win. We have to have this as an additive strategy, but not sort of close our eyes in front of the phenomenon that superstores are around. Actually, we moved into them. Uh, the uh, Comp USA thing, we're adding a couple of more. As we're looking at Sears. We're looking at some of the uh, mass merchandising channels. But we're not going to run into it without consultation with first ourselves and our channel partners today. So there's lots and lots of work going on in expanding our channels to reach more users, make stuff more affordable, more exciting as we move up in the software space in Macintosh and, as I said, up in the enterprise computing era. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things you said in, uh, in Las Vegas and other events so, so people get a more framework of, of well, what I this means? Well, I think, first of all, uh, many people at Apple may be surprised to know that one of the largest brands uh, in the United States is Packard Bell. No, not Compact, IBM, uh, but Packard Bell. And the reason they're so large, but almost unnoticed, is you don't see them in our traditional reseller channels, but they're in a lot of these new emerging channels. And these new emerging channels, uh, which weren't even a factor uh, 18 months ago, now uh, represent almost 50% of the sales of the personal computer industry in the United States. And I've never seen a change in an industry take place as rapidly as this. So we've said that we're going to go into those consumer channels. We're going to bring Macintosh down into those markets because uh, we've got a great brand name and we already have a good franchise in the home market. We see a huge opportunity in home offices, but they want low-cost products in those low-cost channels. So we're going to bring out uh, a low-cost implementation of the Macintosh later this year, 1992, 
with built-in CD-ROM drive and will take advantage of our latest technology, such as QuickTime. And as we move out into 1993, uh, most of our desktop machines will be CD-ROM capable, and they will be fully able to take advantage of the QuickTime technology. So we think we can get the kind of differentiation on the desktop that we did uh, this past Christmas selling season with the PowerBooks, mm -hmm. with the I product you carry yeah. around. So that was the first part of our announcement. Yeah, I think the uh, display with CD-ROM is important. A couple of years ago, we felt that uh, every personal computer ought to be, have a hard drive, and this was a big deal at the time, and now we don't even think about it. And I think the same thing is with CD-ROMs, that today we believe that, you know, is it really right? I think in a couple of years from now, every computer has a CD-ROM built in because it is a very, very effective mechanism to distribute software and to distribute information rather than having diskettes and lots of books. So I think that in itself is a huge market opportunity before we even get to the multimedia titles, and that will be over time even on networks. So yeah. why don't you explain this well, a little bit? I think what's, uh, <coughs> what really uh, <coughs> got us to make the decision to uh, become proactive with CD-ROM drives was the, the quick success of, of our QuickTime technology because developers looked at this and they said, now we can build applications that have value. You know, but we need a platform out there so we can get a return on the investment. And until Apple said that we were going to uh, build this into our, our base level machines, there wasn't going to be enough installed base out there for the content developers to be able to make a return on it. Well, we've made that announcement. We're going aggressively after it. In the past, there are only one million installed base in the world of CD-ROM drives, 360,000 sold in 1991. About 4.5% of Macintoshes have CD-ROM drives, so that's very, very small. On the other hand, when we say we're going to put these into most of our desktop machines, and probably eventually all of our desktop machines, uh, along with the QuickTime technology, that's a very powerful story to the content developers. And what we're seeing is a terrific response to the content developers. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that we take the high ground on QuickTime before Microsoft has their multimedia CD-ROM conference, because what they will do is to set the standard much lower and drag away those developers who would otherwise be in our platform unless we become proactive. And that's why we have really said that we're going on the offense. Michael, the other thing we talked about uh, at CES, uh, which is a con the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, was that Apple was going to go into the personal electronics business. And by that, we were very clear to say we had no interest to, to go into today's consumer electronics industry. In fact, uh, if you read the papers recently, you see that the Japanese consumer electronics leaders are actually showing tremendous uh, plunge in profits down 50%, down 80%, as the case may be. The problem is there are no hit products in traditional consumer electronics today. But the industry is about to make a transition from analog technology to digital technology. With digital technology, you need software. You also need a great user interface know-how. And the skill that Apple brings to all of this is that we understand user-centered devices. We know how to make them appealing in, in design. We've had some terrifically exciting technology. Uh, we've just recently demonstrated uh, some of it with, with handwriting, with gesture, with speech, uh, with QuickTime multimedia. So we have lots of exciting innovation that we can bring into this industry, but we're going to use a different financial model than we did with Macintosh. With Macintosh, we said, we'll invest everything ourselves, we'll keep it to ourselves. With personal electronics, what we're saying is that we will share the risk, we will share the investment. There'll probably be a wide range of different products out there. We can't predict with accuracy which ones are going to be uh, the most popular areas, but we know that once we see some experience out there, what people want, that we've got technologies that will let us build families of these, these products. Yeah. We may sell these products ourselves because the Apple name is a very powerful name, but other people will be selling them too. So we build both a, a software technology revenue stream as well as, as the finished good product revenue stream. I think when we demonstrated this knowledge navigator some years ago, people were very skeptical whether this was the, the pipe dream of the year 2000. I think that what's apparent more and more is that most of these technologies that were presented in there are real and are productizable in very, very, very um, um, near future. So I think that, that having a vision of building more and more personalized products, which is very clearly Apple's mission and, and the guts of this company is to be really driven by what turns on users, whether you build it in large systems or ones you carry with you all the time. I think that's where we stand out and what 
people envious for. Uh, this, this new brave world of, of uh, telecom being high-speed digital networks, allowing content to be digitized and uh, shifted over networks point to point in, in, in two ways, allows probably a whole new fleet of products uh, uh, to come out, highly software-driven digital type devices, which is very different than the uh, notion of consumer electronics a la yesterday, which was in analog and, and not very user-friendly, witness the VCR type problem we all have to get this thing running and using all the functionality. I think what the market values is really functional products that do things for customers, do it immediately, do it simple, and do it affordable. That's, I think, where the sweet spot is. Yeah, you know, I think you're space. absolutely right. Uh, the, the big difference between a personal computer, even a great one like a Macintosh, is that it's a general purpose machine. It requires some level of skill to be able to operate it. With a personal electronics product, what we call a personal digital assistant, or PDA, what we're really looking at is a particular usefulness. It's focused to do some particular thing, and it has to be very usable. It's been amazing, Michael, the kind of response that we've gotten since we made the announcements at CES. We showed QuickTime at Macworld, and then we talked about Apple's interest to move into telecommunications at Harvard. We have been inundated with companies that say, we have to work with you. In Japan, you know, all the major players say, we have to work with you. You've got the, the, the key missing technology that we need to get into digital personal electronics. The telecom companies, not only in the United States, but in Europe and other parts of the world say, we have to work with you. We see that telecommunications is going from analog to, to digital. You've got to have devices at the end of that line. And clearly, Apple sees the vision, and you've got the user-centered technology. So there's a huge opportunity for Apple to create not just a new business for us, but to create even new industries in the 1990s mm. that can be larger than the personal computer industry was in the 1980s. Here's the challenge, though. As we go from a single product company that is fighting it out in the streets in a commodity industry with Macintosh and winning, uh, how do we implement as we go from a single product company to a multi-business company on a global scale with opportunities in personal computing with products with Macintosh with enterprise computing, with client server, as that shift takes place in large corporate accounts. And then with personal electronics, with a revolution that's going on as the world goes from analog to, to a digital. Yeah. That's an incredibly big challenge for a company, even of Apple size, to be able to uh, do all of that. And I'd really like uh, kind of your insights of, of how do we make that transition as a company? Because implementation is, is going to be well, really tough for all I, of us. I think this is probably on, on, on the minds of every employee at Apple is to is our plate to full, number one, and how do we go from what we have and not let loose on what we have to bridge into this new, brave world? Um, I think the first prerequisite is that Macintosh keeps winning. Um, it said that even with lesser gross margin, once we can put innovation into the Macintosh and get more market, we need to have this as a growth business. But, but let me ask this you a, a question, though, Michael, because you and I both been asked this question. Um, some people say, well, why spend all that time on this, on this new stuff? Why worry about enterprise? Why worry about personal electronics? Why not just stick to our knitting, only do Macintosh, and uh, let someone else worry about these new opportunities? I, do you I, think that's sustainable? No, it's not. It's not. We, we, even at 15 or 18 percent market share, which we enjoy right now, coming from something like eight in units, it's not sustainable because we will slowly and slowly be relegated to a niche player. We want to be a mainstream company. And it starts with having a mod, mod, not a marginal share in Macintosh, but a much more substantial share. It has to say we have to build around the Macintosh. It's tough to win today because entries into the marketplace in this Intel, Microsoft cartel have no barrier and cost to entry. They're setting these new price points, prefabricated and packaging this thing. Dell Computer is not a computer company. It's a distribution and packaging yeah. company. So is Packard Bell or Southgate or Eastgate or Westgate, all these names that are called the others. They are the major force in the market in terms of setting these low price points. And as I said before, we're not immune. So we've got to fight this by trying to put innovation, i.e. growth, back in the industry by having new applications, utilizing all these properties that we're going to work on in both systems design in the Mac and software. So that has to work. It's tough. It has to be implementation, implementation, months by months, quarter by quarter, year by year. If we blink on this, it's over. It isn't enough, though. 
And nobody else is excluded. If you look at the likes of Sun or, or DEC or IBM, they are not safe, even in their core business, because the, move, the world has moved beyond what their core competence was. People don't want mini computers and mainframes. People want stuff that we have. Yeah, well, I, th I think, uh, and you made this point uh, earlier on in the conversation, that we got our position with Macintosh in business because of our graphics, desktop publishing. But most of what was done in business was computation and transaction. You know, now that Windows is there, maybe we are still better and will continue to be for several more years. But some customers are coming back and saying, I don't care if your technology is better. What I want is something that I can buy from anybody, which will deal with not only graphics for creative use in audiovisual departments or graphic arts mm -hmm. departments, but also will deal with transactions and computation. And in the client-server world, if we can't <coughs> play in that, we will find not only our inability to grow further blocked, but we'll start to see that we'll see our share eroding further and further, and we'll actually become an isolated company once again. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. We have no choice but to go forward with enterprise. It would have been crazy to do it alone. So I think hooking up with IBM now six or seven months later has turned out to be uh, a very good decision. In the personal electronics, it isn't just about consumer electronics through retail stores. Uh, as you know, we've had at least one major airline who's looked at one of our products and say, you know, if you can deliver that product, uh, and this is one that lets you uh, play back information, which takes advantage of several of our, of our, of our technologies, uh, it said, I can use that to do all of my documentation for all of my service and maintenance people, and I'd like 50,000 of those products over the next several years. Now, that's one airline. Mm -hmm. And if you start to expand that into training, into salespeople, they're going to be major business customers who are going to want these kinds of products. And that's why we've chosen to call them personal electronics, not consumer electronics, because they really cut right across commercial markets, education markets, not just consumer electronic markets. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that um, we are probably still uh, more technology rich than we are uh, field effective, say. Um, take, take an example on briefing centers. When we have two visits a day from major corporations around the world coming through, and they see what we can do in, in providing tools to create business application, mission critical applications, you like to cry when they say, we had no idea how good you are including networking, pervasive networking, because that's built into uh, System 7. We do this better than everybody else. Yet, how do we get this story out? You know, if we can bring customers through, tell them a story, just as we're telling our Apple employees a story on, the, on this video, uh, this is a, a powerful motivator to get them to understand that Apple is different. We are differentiated with innovation. We can implement. We're a multi-business company. We've got a future through the rest of the 90s. Those are powerful messages. And you can do that best when you can bring them on your own turf to a corporate briefing center. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to have to look at, at how we train our people for different tasks as the channels change and as the customer requirements ch change. And so we really need to get our, our people thinking about, you know, how do I learn new tasks? That this is a lifelong learning experience as we talk a lot with our education customers, mm -hmm. but it affects us right here at home as well. And right. this is a global issue. Well, let's see if we can sum up some of these, these points, Michael. Uh, we started off by talking about the first building block for Apple in the 1990s, which is market share. We're making tremendous progress out there, but the industry is growing slower. We see the gross margins continuing to ease down. There's a lot of uh, price pressure out there. Uh, we believe that if we get hit products and we can keep that sustainable, uh, and I think the pipeline is filled with some very good candidates going out in the future, that we can continue to be able to gain market share. But in a slow growth industry, if we only grow at 5 to 10 percent revenue a year, that's not a very attractive business. We've got to get our business growing in the, in the 10 to 15 percent range anyway with our base Macintosh business. And we can do that with much better implementation, training our people to be able to deal with the changes that have gone on in, in the industry, and just focusing on a global level on getting products out quickly so we get a fast return on these products because the, the, the life in which a product is successful is getting shorter and shorter, whether it's a power book or a desktop machine. In the enterprise area, uh, we are now moving closer to uh, getting uh, real solutions out there, first with interoperability, uh, second with PowerPC now, about uh, you know, less than 18 months away. Power Open is moving along well. Taligent is up and running. That's really a mid-1990s uh, impact. 
and Kaleida is also taking shape. So all the efforts with IBM are going well. They play a key role in our future, but it's not the only role. And therefore, in addition to what we do with first building block of Macintosh market share, second building block of alliance with IBM on enterprise, we have a third building block, and that's about our futures with personal electronics. There we have a unique opportunity. No one else is better poised to convert their technologies into products and their products into businesses as Apple is. Uh, but this takes uh, a great deal of, of management time to build new relationships with, with uh, telecom companies, with content developers, with new channels like consumer electronics. And how we implement all of this uh, at a time when we really aren't growing headcount for the company uh, is a real challenge. And so I think we at the EMT level have got to start handing off you know, more accountability to managers down in the organization so that we can focus our time on some of these new growth businesses, but still know that we have got the major attention of our senior managers at Apple on our core. We can't take our eye off of the Macintosh core, even as we get excited about some of the new things like personal electronics. Absolutely right. And I mean, that, that's where we try to bring in uh, more process and, and, and not bureaucracy, process. Uh, fact-based decisions, more accountability. That's where AQM plays, and I'm thrilled about the progress that we made with applying uh, the AQM process, not to demonstrate something, rather than to really make this part of everybody's life. And the consultant we had in early on said, Apple is asking, tell us where we are vis-a-vis -vis other sort of renowned companies. He said, you're the fastest company after first year to have gone through adopting the principle and there's tangible evidence of some of these success stories in multiple departments uh, doing this. So in a lesser growth business that needs to be managed much more tightly, we can't do this without ever blinking on implementation, process management, accountabilities, and award process orientation rather than just the, the winging it type, type of management style. And that's where we try, as you pointed out, have to instill more pushing accountability and responsibility downwards into the organization and let us worry about the strategic options for Apple, but the running of the business is absolutely much more down in the organization itself with good data, fact-based management, I'm not saying just because I know something empirically, I can make decisions. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the AQM, Apple Quality Management, uh, is a great example of, of how we re-engineer work at Apple. So it isn't just about the quality control that goes on in the factory or the engineering labs. It's about quality that goes through the entire systemic process, including the relationship with the customer and a relationship with vendors and, and everything that we, we, we do. And I think in the 1990s that uh, Apple has got to be on the leading edge of how we re-engineer work. That's where productivity comes from. Uh, we've got great tools to do that with. We've got very smart people. 70% of Apple employees are professionals, you know, which is extraordinarily mm -hmm. high uh, ratio. And I think we need to get even more diversity in our, in our management. Uh, we're very anxious, as you know, to uh, get more women into management positions. We want more minorities. Uh, we want people of color moving into, into more senior positions. And these things won't happen unless uh, you and I personally put our commitment behind it. And I know both of us feel very strongly about well, this. I we want an Apple of the 1990s to not just be an, a company that succeeds by the numbers, but we want it to be an environment where people feel that this is a leading edge company in every way. And we have an extremely smart workforce. This is not smokestack at all. And so we have to have disagreements. We have to argue about how to do this thing. This is not top down, in my opinion. But I think what we have set in place since 20 months, so to speak, is that we don't fight. We don't, we don't have major, major discrepancies of what's this all about. What we have to have is good arguments about how to do things. And that just uh, brings people forward in, in excelling in their, in their personality, in their style. And, and we see uh, who can lead more and, 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 and can take more. I have asked my managers to be absolutely vigilant on affirmative action and, and look at the uh, work pool and, and employee base in widening uh, what we have today. And that means uh, women in, in, in higher positions. It means uh, other groups coming forward. And so they are absolutely looking at that, how we can do this. Now, as we move around the, the, the country, I mean, we have made choices in Colorado and Austin this has some challenges with it because what we had in Fremont, uh, can we build this in Colorado? And, and so we have to look at all these aspects. But it's, but it's in people's mind. It is not an edict either. It's people are dealing with this 
at the at the managerial level, I'm I'm pretty uh, happy about the progress we made. That people absolutely live this rather than it's hokey or lip service or something. Michael, I'd just like to uh, uh, finally make one comment about working together because I think uh, the way you and I work together is probably a pretty good symbol for the for the rest of the company. We've learned over the last two years that we've been able to get an awful lot done when we have one agenda and we work it as as a team. I think the organization knows um, that you know you and I feel pretty comfortable working with, with each other, and they can talk to either one of us, and they get the same consistent story, and we haven't changed you know, in two years in terms of where we're headed. Uh, what we need to do is to make sure that symbolism gets translated throughout all parts of Apple. We, as we make this transition from single product company or a company with lots of technologies that wants to turn them into businesses, the only way we will implement it successfully is people working together. It's the cross-functionalization relationships, and it's the handoff of things from you and me and other members of the EMT, we've got to move more of the decision making down into uh, other layers of the organization. Uh, there's no more bandwidth left for us to do it. It's not good for the company, and we've got to develop people who can take on uh, bigger and bigger roles in yeah. the management of what is a very large global corporation. I think what we're doing is we're managing today as much as we prepare for the future. Good. And I think that's a great close. Good to be with you all, and we look forward to keeping you abreast of the many changes and exciting things that are going on at Apple in the future.